Hey everyone, in this video I wanted to update a video I did a couple of years ago about Azure Kubernetes Services AKS networking. There's been a number of enhancements over the years, both in terms of how we can interact with the control plane, but also how we can think about the IP addresses of the pods we run on our workloads. As always, this is useful, a like and subscribe is appreciated. So one of the things I wanted to really be clear about up front is when we think of the Azure Kubernetes service, so we have AKS, there are different flows that come into play. I can think about, well, there's the control plane, which is really focused around that API server. That's the bit we interact with. I can think about, then we have the nodes, and obviously on the nodes, we have multiple pods. And then we also expose services outside of the cluster. So if I think about the types of communications we have, well, there are communications to and from the control plane. Maybe I'm using the kubectl. Maybe I'm using the Azure portal. But then also there's communication between the nodes, the pods, the services, and that control plane. So I can think about control plane traffic. Then I can think about, well, we also have that east-west traffic between the pods in the same cluster. So we, we think of that as east-west, because it's going that, that horizontal. So we have that type of traffic. And then, of course, we have the traffic that we say is north-south. So north-south would be, hey, from the various workloads, the ingress, egress services, as part of our cluster, we have that north-south traffic, so into and out of the cluster. So we really have those three different types of traffic. And the key part we think about is that these are all independent of each other. Now, there are exceptions to that, but for the most part, they're independent. The API server connectivity is independent of the networking stack of the pods which is independent of any north-south ingress-egress type traffic. So when I talk about the options available, except for a very few exceptions, for example, if I think of um, App Gateway, there's some challenges with that with a certain type of ingress um, when I have the overlay networking today. But apart from those few exceptions, they're all independent of one another. So let's break these types of traffic down and see what's really changed. So we'll start with the control plane. So I think of this control plane, and we'll go into a bit more detail about that. So on the control plane, as I mentioned, there are different types of services that make up the control plane. Now the key part with Azure Kubernetes, this is a fully managed service. I'm not really doing anything related to these services. And if I think about the services, well, there's things like con various controllers, and there are multiple different controllers in the environment. There's things, controllers related to nodes, to jobs, to endpoints, to service accounts and tokens. They look at things like, hey, is a node down? Um, as a job had a failure. But these just run as part of that managed control plane. Then we have the scheduler. The scheduler is saying, hey, look, there's some new pods. Um, I need to get them running on some nodes. So the scheduler is part of that process. There's the etcd database. So the etcd database is that key value persistent store, the configuration of the environment. Then the really important one when we think about communications is the API server. And the API server is the only component that exposes a remote service. It's communicated to and from things like the kubelets that run on the nodes, um, kube proxy. If I'm running commands, I'm talking kubectl, I'm talking to that API server. So it's this component that we really focus on when we think about control plane interactions. Now, if we're thinking about those interactions, let's add in the idea of, well, hey, I have a virtual network. So in Azure, when I think about networking, that virtual network 
has a certain IP space. So we have a certain CIDR range, which has a, a finite size that I define based on what's available in my environment. And if I think about that breakdown, well, we break this down into subnets. So for example, I'll just for now draw a subnet one. And then in that subnet, we have various things. For example, I have a node. So we have a particular node from our cluster, and that node runs various things. Obviously, it runs pods. We're used to the, those ideas. But we also have things like the kubelet. Sorry, so I just got this watch and I had Siri turned on. I've turned it off now. So we have things like the kubelet. We have things like the cube proxy. And those are key components within our node that are going, going to go and talk to that API server. So how do we talk to that API server? So the first option, and this is really the default, well, is that API server has a public endpoint. So that's really kind of option one. There's a public endpoint there. So that makes it very easy to use. Hey, obviously, all of those components can go and talk to this endpoint. I externally can run kubectl. I can use the Azure portal from anywhere. And I can just get to that public endpoint. Now, I can restrict it. I can configure authorized IP ranges so that only those may communicate to it. But it's a public endpoint. The second option is when we create the AKS cluster, we can make it a private cluster. So what a private cluster does is hey, I have another subnet here. It creates a private endpoint. So our next option is, hey, we'll have a private endpoint. And obviously with private endpoints, there's various DNS that's part of that as well. So now to communicate, hey, that API server is also available, well, instead of available, via a private endpoint. So it's one or the other. It cannot have a public endpoint and a private endpoint. So if I deploy it as a private cluster, it does not have a public endpoint, it only has a private endpoint. Now that means, great, the kubelet, the kube proxy, they talk to the private endpoint. For my tooling, if I'm running kubectl, if I'm using Azure Portal, I have to be running that from a machine either in this VNet or a connected virtual network. Now, this could be on-premises. It could be site-to-site -site VPN, point-site VPN, express route private peering. But I would need that DNS entry that's using that private link alias instead. So that's going to then restrict how I can also interact from a, hey, I want to run commands and management against it. So hey, that's, that's a deploy time option. There is a third option now. So we now have this option of VNet integration for the API server. So I'll just draw another subnet for simplicity. So now our option is I'm thinking about VNet integration. So this is our option three. And what that's really doing behind the scenes is it's a delegated subnet. So I have to say, hey, this subnet, I'm going to give over for this API server VNet integration. In there, what it's really doing, it's an internal load balancer which has a virtual IP from that subnet. So now, when I talk to that virtual IP, so the kubelet, the kube proxy, they will all talk to that IP address. It's not even using DNS at this point. Those components will just use the IP address directly. Now, optionally, I can have the public endpoint as well. So this is now something I can actually turn on and off at will. So I can go, hey, I'm doing the VNet integration, but maybe I've got some external developers. Hey, I need to enable the public endpoint for them. I can still use that authorized set of IP ranges so only their machines or their network can talk to it. And then, hey, I'll turn it off. So I can turn that on and off really whenever I want to. If I deployed the cluster as a public endpoint, I can move to VNet integration. 
I cannot move off of it. So once I'm running VNet integration, I can't disable that VNet integration. But hey, if I deployed with that public endpoint and now I see this great new VNet integration option, I say, I want that. I don't have to redeploy the cluster. I can migrate to this and then optionally disable or enable that public endpoint. So I have that choice available to me. So that's how we think about the control plane interactions. Public endpoint, private endpoint, VNet integration. Obviously, VNet integration doesn't require private link, the tunnels, any of those things at all. But now let's think about, well, then we have the nodes and the node pools that we see. Like, we don't really see the control plane. That's hidden away from us, that's managed all away somewhere else. But we do see the nodes and node pools. And actually, what I want to do quickly, let's make this a bit bigger, just so I can draw on this a bit easier. So, let's give myself a bigger virtual network. So I'll come out here. And again, this is still a VNet in my subscription. It still has a particular CIDR range that I've deployed to it. So the whole point here is, hey, our nodes and our node pools, they live within the customer's virtual network. And then I can think of really three key elements related to that existence uh, within the virtual network. So obviously the first one is the nodes themselves. The nodes themselves, these boxes, well remember, they live inside a node pool. So I drew one node, but the reality is that node is actually part of a node pool. And remember that node pool can absolutely have multiple nodes. They're of a particular configuration. So that was one node, there's two, three, there's other nodes in that node pools as well. So that's a particular subnet. Now every node needs an IP address. So the nodes get an IP address from the subnet that the node pool is deployed to. So that's really a key part. Now each node pool can be deployed into a different subnet. Or I could share them. So I could think about, well, actually, I'm then gonna have a subnet two. So we'll have another subnet over here. Oh, wrong color. Another subnet over here, make it slightly bigger. So this is subnet two. And this could have a completely different node pool in it. So hey, I've got node pool two. So node pool two, and node pool two has its sets of nodes. Now these are all part of the same cluster. So if I think about it from an AKS perspective, these are all one cluster instance. So it's one AKS instance that I'm really thinking about here. So I have node pool two. That could be in a different subnet from this other node pool that's part of the same cluster. Or I can have multiple node pools this is node pool three, sharing a subnet. So the whole key point is the nodes, they're getting an IP address from this subnet. That's really the whole point of this. So node pools can share a subnet or I can put node pools in their own subnets. It's my decision when I deploy the node pool, one of my configurations is, hey, what subnet should this new node pool be created in? So that's all of the different network modes we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about some different network plugins for the pods themselves. Doesn't affect the node pools themselves and how the nodes, those basically the VMs, get their IP addresses. Now a question may come up, well what about if I have multiple AKS clusters? Um, could multiple AKS clusters share a subnet? And then it really does vary based on what is our network plugin model. Like KubeNet, you can't share. If I'm using Azure CNI, for the most part, yes, including Dynamic. But if I'm using the new Azure CNI overlay mode, which we're gonna talk about, no, I can't share. And typically, you, you probably don't share a subnet very much with multiple AKS clusters, but technically, um, for that Azure CNI, you could if you really, really wanted to. So that was the node pools. 
But then remember, in addition to the nodes, obviously they need to get IP addresses, we can then also think about, we have services like those ingress, egress. So I have to configure a subnet for the ingress, egress as well. If I think like an internal load balancer, well, that ingress, egress could share a subnet, or once again, as part of the configuration, I could actually say, hey, maybe we've got a subnet three, Actually, my ingress egress, I'm going to put in this subnet. So then my internal load balancer, for example, it's going to go and get its IP address, its virtual IP from where I've defined that service. So I have a lot of options around those elements. So I create multiple node pools. Hey, the node pools have the nodes in them. The nodes need an IP address. That's really that virtual machine in the virtual machine scale sets that powers this they can share, they can have their own. Then I have the ingress egress services. Hey, I could, once again, I could use the same subnet as my nodes if I wanted to, or once again, I could think about, no, I, I want them to have their own. So that's available to me. And that's even shown in the documentation. So if we jump over super, super fast for a second, if we look at the Azure Load Balancer documentation, it says, I think it's like the second point, yeah. Hey, load balancer, we name the subnet. So we specify the subnet for those internal load balancers. So if I don't configure it, then it will just use that of the node pool. But if I do configure it, then yes, it can absolutely be different. So I have that choice as part of it. So that's two of those three things I talked about, the nodes and the node pools, and then the ingress, um, egress services they obviously have to go somewhere as well. Then we have the pods. When we kind of drew that over here, we have these pods that host the containers that really run our workload, that run, that we've created those images in our container registries and we're running those microservices. Well, they need IP addresses as well. And while, when we think about the nodes and the ingress, egress services, I don't know why I wrote G on that. I should really, should, I don't, grr. That really should be an E, I suppose. Um, for those ingress, egress, those are gonna get an IP address from the virtual network. Things can be a little bit different when I think about the pods themselves. Because remember, whereas nodes, we may have very big numbers of nodes, maybe even we have thousands of nodes. But if I think about things like the pods, well, we may, might have a couple of hundred pods per node. So that, pales into consideration the number of IPs that I need for nodes compared to the number of IPs I'm gonna need for the pods themselves. And in those very large scales, I may be IP constrained in my virtual network. The actual usable routable IP space I have, I just can't handle the number of pods I wanna run. So we have a number of different options when I think about those pods and how they're gonna get their IP addresses. And that's why I wanna spend a bit of time on now. now Kubernetes itself does not have a native network plugin. Instead, when we deploy the cluster, we specify what is the network plugin we want to use for our AKS cluster. So let's give ourselves a bit of space for a second. So when I think about my AKS deployment, one of the options I can do at deployment time is KubeNet. The other option I get is the Azure CNI. Now, one option you do have beyond these is AKS does now allow you to create an AKS cluster without a network plugin specified. What that lets you do is then you can bring your own. So I create the cluster and then I go and add the network plugin. So maybe that's better for me so I can get better um, consistency maybe with what I'm doing on premises, for example. So I do have flexibility beyond these, but these are really the, the two I'm gonna focus on uh, as part of this talk. Now, when I think about the IP range I can actually use, it really does vary. But also, it really does vary at what is 
the point I define the IP range that the pods are going to use. Is it at the entire AKS cluster level? Or is it at a particular node pool level? So all the pods in this node pool get their IP addresses from one place. A different node pool can get from another place. Or is it regardless of node pools, it's something defined at the AKS cluster level. And it varies. So I think about, I have these two network plugins. Well, actually with Azure CNI, as we're going to see, there are some additional options we have. So in addition to the regular Azure CNI, I can also now use a dynamic mode. And we're gonna go into detail on all of these, don't worry. And there is also an overlay mode. So there's really these four different options. And when I think about the pod side range definition, i.e. where am I telling it the IP range of the pods, if it's KubeNet, that definition is at the cluster level. I define one large side range for the pods that applies at the cluster, doesn't matter what node pools I have, they share that pod range. If I'm using Azure CNI though, well in Azure CNI, it's defined at the node pool level. Same for dynamic, it's at the node pool level. And that actually makes a lot of sense once we dig into these, because essentially the pods in Azure CNI and Azure CNI dynamic they're really sharing a network configuration with the nodes themselves. And because nodes themselves can go to different subnets, as we talked about, well, so therefore can the pods. Then we have overlay, this new thing that you may not even be very aware of. Well, that's also defined at the cluster level. And what you're gonna see in common with these is, well, can the pod use a different CIDR logical IP space, i.e. can it be different from the nodes? And so what we see here with KubeNet, the answer is yes, it can. With Azure CNI, no, it has to be the same IP space as the node pool. With Dynamic, it's also tied to the deployment of the node pool. But with Overlay, yes, it's a different logical range, different IP space from that of the node pools. So we can see, hey, if it's defined at the cluster, it's, it's a logical different IP space, which is why. So when it's a different logical IP space, so for KubeNet and this new Azure CNI overlay mode, it's different IP space from the underlying nodes in the node pool, and I define it at the cluster. So the cluster has an IP range defined for the pods, the everything within that cluster. With Azure CNI and Dynamic, it, it's not a different separate IP space for the pods from the virtual network, and so it's defined at the node pool. And so one of the big benefits we see with KubeNet and now the overlay is it is a different logical IP space from the virtual network. So that separate logical IP space is huge when we start thinking about, well, hey, my virtual network is constrained in terms of the number of IP spaces I have available. Um, yeah, maybe I've got 10, 20, 100 nodes. Maybe I've got thousands of nodes. I've got multiple node pools and I can have a thousand nodes in each node pool. Well, that, that, that in itself, just for the nodes would be a pretty big IP space. But now if I wanted to put, let's just say we take a default of one of them of 30 pods per node, which is kind of the, the Azure CNI world. Well, now all of a sudden I need 30 times the IP space. That, that's a huge difference. And maybe I just don't have that available to me. So one of the huge benefits we liked about KubeNet was I didn't have to use up IP space from the underlying virtual network. 
it was just completely different IP space. But there were some challenges with KubeNet about the way it actually was implemented and some of the additional restrictions that would add because of that implementation. Well, now we have Overlay as well, which behaves like KubeNet, but it does away with a lot of those restrictions. And if I think about it, probably a lot of the communication is in ingress, egress. I want to go through some service anyway, some load balancer anyway. I simply don't talk directly to a specific pod. And so I don't really care if the pods are on a different IP space and not directly accessible from outside the AKS cluster. I'm going to go through some ingress service anyway. So I like this idea of separating out the IP space. So let's, let's look at some details around this so we can really drill in and, and see how these things function behind the scenes. So let's think about drawing a virtual network again. So we'll, we'll go back to our idea of VNet. And I'm not drawing um, a whole lot of detail about multiple node pools or anything like that, but realize again, I could have multiple node pools, I could have lots of nodes. Their rules apply. It's regardless of the network plugin and config, I'm using for the pods. So I'm just going to draw a very skinny VNet. And for now, I'm just going to break it into two subnets. So I'm going to think about my subnet one and my subnet two, which obviously has a portion of that virtual network IP space. And then for now, let's just think of it as I'm going to focus on having, I'm just going to draw two nodes. So I'm going to draw two fairly large nodes just to make sure I don't run out of space, which I did before. So I'm going to think one node, fairly skinny, and another node. So I've got some nodes. Now remember, those nodes are in a node pool that was deployed to a certain subnet. And for now, so we'll say these particular nodes are in this subnet. So in terms of an IP address, it's getting an IP address from here, and it's getting an IP address. So they're in the same node pool or multiple node pools that were deployed into the same subnet. So they're getting an IP address from that particular subnet. Now, let's look at our four options for the networking space. And we'll start with KubeNet. So with KubeNet, I'm going to use a different color for each of them, so bear with me. We'll start with uh, purple. There we go. So let's start with KubeNet. Now remember, the whole point of KubeNet, KubeNet has its own pod CIDR range. So with KubeNet, I define a pod CIDR range. And this is at, I have to define this at the cluster level. So I'm going to draw multiple ones on the same set of nodes. Realize that's not possible. The entire AKS cluster has to use the same network mode and plugin. I'm just drawing it here so you can contrast what's happening. But in the reality, the nodes would just be one. The node pools would just be one. Everything in the same cluster would just be one. But I'm drawing it so you can contrast them. But just make sure you're, you're keeping that in mind. So here I have an IP space, a separate one defined at the cluster level. This would apply to all of the node pools. So what this means straight away, is I have this separate pod side range, and let's um, draw it. So I'm going to apply it to this little group here. So this actual subnet would only need to be big enough to handle the number of nodes I want and those ingress egress controllers if I didn't use a different subnet for those. So this could actually be a very, very small subnet. It's really just based on the number of nodes I want. Maybe some of that, hey, how the node maintenance happening in parallel, that would affect the size of that subnet as well. But really, I don't have to care about how many pods I'm going to end up running. It's completely irrelevant for this. So if I had that limited IP space, hey, a great option. Now, each of these nodes will get a slash 24 from that pod side of range. Um, but the actual IPs it's going to reserve is based on what is the max pod value that I define as part of that deployment. Now, by default for KubeNet, I guess I should really draw this in. So if we think about max pods, so max pods is what's the maximum number of pods I can deploy on any particular node. So if we think about max 
pods. So my default max pods. And there's also a maximum, a max max pods. And actually the max max pods is always the same. Um, if I try and do it, it's always 250. So regardless of the model, the plugin I'm using, it's always 250. Now the default for KubeNet is 110. Again, I can change that, but that's the default. If I don't do anything else, the maximum number is gonna be 110. So then I go and create pods. So hey, there's a pod here. There's a pod here. Where are they getting their IP from? This IP space. It is not getting any IPs from the underlying subnet of the virtual network. I defined this completely different IP space as part of the cluster deployment. When I create the pods, they get it from here. So this could be a huge um, potential space. So I could have loads of number of nodes, but the maximum number obviously per node is still 250. That's, that's just a max as part of AKS. So those IPs, they're coming from here. Now what's happening behind the scenes, and it's a good thing to understand, the way KubeNet works is it's using user-defined routing, it's using IP forwarding, but it creates a route table for those user-defined routes. And that user-defined route is basically saying, hey, for this portion of this pod side range, um, you need to go to this particular node that's hosting that. So KubeNet to function has to create, I should draw it over here, it has to create a route table. And that route table has to get linked to the subnet. So that's the way it's working behind the scenes. Now as part of this, every time I make a change, this is an Azure Resource Manager change. This is ARM. So ARM has to make these updates updates for me. So that can potentially get throttled. That may make it hard to manage in a very large environment when I have these various routing tables for my environment. One, I don't know if it's a nice trick, this routing table, technically I could link to other subnets. So then things in those other subnets could also directly address the pod's IP address because now it knows how to get to that IP space. But it's working via this route table. But a route table has a max of 400 routes. So I can only have 400 nodes maximum. If I'm using dual stack, so if I'm using IPv4 side range down here, so you think, okay, IPv4, it's the side range, I have to have that. Optionally, I can add IPv6. Well, now there's two IP spaces. I need two user-defined routes for every node. So now I could have a maximum of 200 nodes. So if I went dual stack, I've now half the number of nodes I can have. So one of the things that KubeNet does, hey, it's great that I can now have this separate IP space so I'm not using IP addresses from my subnet, but I've limited the number of nodes I can potentially have. Whereas AKS, I can have a thousand nodes per node pool. I can have multiple node pools. There are clusters that got 5,000 nodes in them. Not if I'm using KubeNet, I'm gonna max out at 400. So there's this Cube controller, a manager that's controlling all of the allocations. Yes, it's nice that I get this separate IP space, but this route table and some of the performance things can be a little bit painful. Now, obviously, if there's any kind of interaction outside of that virtual network, then it has to be snatted. So it does snatting via the IP address of the node that's hosting the pod. Um, but the pods, even on different nodes can still talk directly to each other. In all of our scenarios, the pods can always talk directly to each other, even if they're on different nodes, it doesn't impact that. So KubeNet, great, separate IP space. Then there's Azure CNI. I'm gonna start with just regular Azure CNI. 
So now I can think, okay, I'll draw this one over here. Azure CNI. And this is probably the, the simplest one in a lot of ways in terms of the IP addressing, because with Azure CNI, the pods Well, they get an IP address from the subnet of the node. So it's there. Now, the reality of the way this actually works is those IPs are pre-allocated per node. So if I actually went and looked at my virtual network and my subnets, if I created Azure CNI, and I just, again, if I've got pods on these ones as well, and I left it at all of the defaults, because the defaults over here with Azure CNI, the max pods are 30. So what you would actually see happen with Azure CNI is it pre-allocates all of the IP addresses. So you'd actually see a whole bunch of IP addresses, I'm not gonna draw, 30 because, well, let's face it, I'm lazy. But you would see a number of IP addresses pre-allocated based on max pods. So it's using all that space up in advance. And then as I create the pods, hey, it uses one of those pre-allocated IPs to give to the Azure CNI. Now this does mean, hey, the pods have a direct IP address on the virtual network. So it's now super easy to directly talk to any specific pod. But again, in most environments with AKS, I don't talk to a specific pod. There are some exceptions to that. Most of the times we're gonna to talk to some ingress controller. Um, could be Nginx, could be App Gateway, it could be an internal load balancer. There are different options for this. So I don't actually care that much about talking directly to the IP addresses. What I actually probably talking to is that ingress egress service, which remember that that could be public facing, so it gets public IP, or it could be internal, it gets an IP address from the subnet I specify for that configuration. But the whole point here is Azure CNI, the pods just get an IP address from the subnet of the node pool. Now, there's a there was an, a newer version of this because people it was challenging. Hey, I've got this max pods thing, it has to pre-allocate. I'm also having the same set of like network security group, the same rules applied to my nodes that I'm applying to my pods. And maybe I don't want that. I wanna be able to have different rules, NSGs applied to the nodes compared to the workloads within them. And I want more flexibility maybe for that IP space. So then there was Azure CNI dynamic. And as the name suggests, it doesn't pre-allocate the IP addresses anymore. It gets the IP address as the pod springs into life based on the scheduler saying, hey, there's a pod, it needs somewhere to live. It's a little bit more nuanced to that. But the key point here as well is, hey, I create the pods as I did before. So pods get created. It's still within our virtual network but it now uses a different subnet. It has to be the same virtual network. It cannot be a different virtual network. But now I specify a different subnet for them. So now in this case, for example, I specified subnet two as the pod subnet. And this one over here, goes over there. So with dynamic mode, it doesn't pre-allocate all the IPs from the subnet based on the max pods. Now here, because it's dynamic, its actual default is 250. Same as the max, because it doesn't care. It's like, hey, I'm specifying a subnet, my default, go nuts, it's 250. And it will just get the IPs as it creates it. Now, that's not quite true. Um, in order to be efficient, the nodes, will actually go and grab batches of 16. So it will actually get batches of 16 IP addresses at a time, 
when it's down to 50%, so eight, it will go and get another batch. So we always make sure it has some IP address in hand, but outside of that little nuance, it's dynamically getting those IP addresses. If I have multiple node pools, I could have a separate subnet used for its pods, or they could be the same. So I have flexibility with that. So I can share a subnet between multiple node pools in the same AKS cluster. And actually, I could even share the same subnet for pods from different node pools in different AKS clusters. That's actually possible with the Azure CNI dynamic mode. And now, again, a nice benefit here is, think of those NSGs. Now I can have network security groups which control the flows of traffic. I could have well, only my nodes now live in this subnet, so I've got a certain set of NSG rules. Only my pods live in this subnet, a certain set, and maybe my ingress, egress services live in a different subnet, so the different things there as well. So it gives me a lot more granularity and control in how I think about actually controlling and managing the traffic. So this, this was a, a huge, huge factor um, for why I would pick kind of KubeNet in the past over Azure CNI was the fact that KubeNet used such a small amount of IP space from the underlying subnet that I'm deployed to. But KubeNet has those pain points. The use of the route tables, the use, the arm has to go and update those. It limits the number of nodes I can have because of the 400 routes per route table. So now there's a new option. There's a new option is Azure CNI overlay. Now, as the name suggests, we now, I'm gonna draw it over here. Now we have Azure CNI overlay. And like KubeNet, it has a separate pod side range. It's now exactly the same way again. We have a different range for the pods. And it, it behaves exactly like KubeNet. So if I now have these pods, you can probably draw the line for me. It's gonna get the IP address from that cluster assigned pod side. Remember, this is not the node pool. It's getting it from this separate side range I defined for Azure CNI overlay. And that actually has a default max of 30. Again, all of them, I can set the max, max pods to 250 if I wanted to, but its default number is 30. The way this works behind the scenes is again at the cluster level, I define my pod side range for the overlay. Each node gets a slash 24. It's a fixed size, I can't change it. It gets a slash 24 from that pod side. So I need to make sure that pod side range I define at the cluster level is big enough based on how many nodes I want. So obviously if I was gonna have like 250 nodes in an AKS cluster, really I need a slash 16 as part of that pod side of space that each one of them can have a slash 24. So you get the idea, based on how many nodes I want, I may have to have a very, very big pod side of range. Once again, all of the pods can talk to each other, just like every one of these four different models, the pods can always talk to each other. But it's not using a route table. I have nothing more to draw on my VNet. It's using an internal construct called a routing domain. So that's programmed by the network control plane, not ARM, not the resource provider. So it's a lot, lot faster. I would see the effective routes if I went and looked at the NIC. So the NIC would show me this plumbing that it's doing. So if I looked at the NIC of the node, I would see these effective routes that's showing me this other IP space. It's like a tenth of a second when I make changes. It's super, super fast. I can have tens of thousands of routes as part of a routing domain. So this limitation of KubeNet disappears. I can have a 5,000 node cluster using this Azure CNI overlay. So this really does go up to really whatever I want to do. Now the node will take the first IP, the dot one, and then the pods, dot two and above. Now, it's not using a route table. 
And remember I talked about, hey, I have the control plane traffic, I have that east-west pod-to-pod traffic, and I have that north-south traffic, and what I configure doesn't interact or impact at all. And remember I said there were a few exceptions, this is an exception. So the pods cannot be communicated to directly from anything outside of that cluster because it's not using a route table. So App Gateway breaks today with this. So I cannot use App Gateway with this Azure CNI overlay because App Gateway, the way it works, actually it communicates to the pods and it can't. So realize today there is a nuance around that exception. I couldn't use App Gateway with this. And really the simplest way to think about Azure CNI overlay is KubeNet without route tables. I mean, it, it's behaving it exactly the same way, but I mean, it's faster because it's not using ARM updates, it's far more scalable, but in terms of what it's doing, hey, they, they look really, really similar because on the surface, it's really, really similar. It's just under the covers, it's completely different how it's actually implemented. And once again, like KubeNet, if I wanna talk outside the cluster, then it's using SNAP. It's snatting via the IP address of the node. And I think sometimes SNAP gets a bad rep. People talk about the performance implication. For most customers, if they are seeing a performance difference, it's a measurement error. It's actually very uncommon that would really have any kind of impact. And so we can actually have a super quick um, look at this. So let's go over here. Let me just reconnect um, into this. So I have an overlay deploy because I just thought it might be fun because maybe most people have not seen an overlay. So we'll start with the virtual network. So it is deployed to West Central right now because it, at the time of recording, it's in preview and it's only in West Central because West Central is the first region uh, AKS deploys things to. I have my address space, so it's 10.2. I have one subnet for my nodes. And what we'll see on connected devices, I'm only using four IP addresses, one for each node, and then one for an internal load balancer. So I specified the same subnet for both my nodes and my ingress egress. So I'm using four IP addresses from the underlying network. And that's kind of an important thing. Also, while I'm here, to save me Kevin to come back to this, if I look at my node, you'll notice I have no route table. So there's no funny business going on on the network itself. If I now go and look, of my overlay cluster. So what we'll see is what's actually nice to look at is if we go over here and look at the JSON view, make sure you've, you've seen that, and I'm gonna change it to the latest version of the API. If we scroll down, I actually need to find the right things, because the portal, because this is in preview, doesn't really understand or show everything that I want to show you. But the key part here the network plugin is Azure, and my plugin mode is overlay. So I'm using the overlay mode, and then we can see I've got a completely separate pod side range. So it's Azure CNI, but it's using a separate pod side range. That's really kind of the, the important thing as part of this. And so if you actually go and look at this, you can see I've, I've got workloads deployed. So you can see I've got my, my three nodes. And if I look at my pods, now there's a few things that we use the service IP space, but look at the pods. The pods, oh, 192.168. A couple of them hook into the IP of the node itself. But then most of my workloads you'll see, yep. Yeah, it's getting it all from that pod side range. And based on the node it's on, you'll see it's either a dot three, a dot two, or a dot one. Remember I said each node gets a slash 24. So if we actually, I don't know if we could expand that out, but you'll see based on the node, it's either on node one, node two, or node three. So it's completely separate from that IP space of the subnet itself. So that, that's really the, the key goal. And I just wanted to show that super quick 
just so it's clear and seeing that in action that I am using a completely different side arrange for the pods. And so the impact on my actual virtual network is almost non-existent. There's almost nothing being used other than nodes and that one internal load balancer I have. So this ability to separate out but not introduce limitations that we had here is really fantastic. Now, all that said, there may still be times where I do want the pods to have directly accessible IP addresses. There are some benefits. Maybe I don't want SNAP. I don't want SNAP in the virtual network or beyond. I want to be able to maybe maintain the pod source IP all the way through to the destination. That might be a requirement I have. Well, I can do that with Azure CNI and Azure CNI Dynamic. Certain workloads and frameworks want to talk to the pod directly. Maybe it's a pod to pod state replication, maybe over multiple clusters. Hey, if the pod needs a directly accessible IP address, Azure CNI or Azure CNI does that. If I want to be aware of the pod IP outside the cluster for security, um, hey, then Azure CNI is probably going to want to, I'm going to do. But in most environments, that, that's not a requirement. As we talked about, most of the time I'm actually coming into and out of the cluster via some ingress controller. Yes, the pods need to talk to each other directly, and I can always do that with all of those different models I can do, but now I can be far more efficient with that IP space from my actual virtual network. So the, the whole point of this is, and hopefully this will clarify sort of the state of the union where we are. Hey, my, my node pools, and the nodes within them are always going to get an IP address from the subnet. But different node pools can be deployed to different subnets. My ingress egress can use the same subnet or different subnets. My control plane, I, I imagine the VNet integration will become the popular one once it's, it's fully GA. Um, for now, I think a lot of customers use private endpoints, so it's not publicly accessible. But the big benefit that VNet integration is I can turn the public on or off at will, and I can still use those authorized IP ranges to talk to it. But then when I think about the actual pod IPing, we have this little chart and idea that either the pods get IP addresses directly from the same subnet as the nodes with Azure CNI, or a different subnet, but always the same VNet with the Azure CNI dynamic, makes them directly addressable. Or I can use an overlay, KubeNet, but I'm limited to a max 400 nodes or 200 if it's dual stack because I have two routes per node. The Azure CNI overlay, there's really no limit to those. I could have 5,000 node clusters because I can have tens of thousands of routes as part of a routing domain. But then it's not using IP addresses from the underlying virtual network. Remember, when it is an overlay, that overlay IP space is always defined at the cluster level, um, not at the node pool. So it's saying I set at the cluster. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope this was useful. I hope it cleared up a few things and brought you up to speed. And uh, until next video, take care.